Here's a question for you. Which of these characters is Kid Flash? A. Wally West B. Wallace West C. Bart Allen D. Bart Allen Trick question! They all are. Except for him. While he may look the part and have the speed to back things up, this particular Kid Flash named Bart Allen, real name Bartor, isn't actually a Kid Flash in the traditional sense. Let me tell you why. Kid Flash, by design, is a sidekick mentee role. The original, Wally West, was the nephew of Silver Age Flash, Barry Allen's love interest, ace reporter and totally not his stepsister, Iris West. Coming from a not-so-great family life and being a super fan of the Central City Speedster, Wally becomes Kid Flash after a freak accident in the same laboratory Barry got his own powers, intrinsically connecting him to something called the Speed Force. Basically the embodiment of the universe's kinetic energy, the Speed Force is what gives Barry, Golden Age Flash Jay Garrick, 1800s folk hero Max Mercury, as well as Barry's own future children, Don and Don Allen, their own powers of perpetual motion. These powers would be inevitably passed down through the generations to one Bartholomew Allen, whose dad banged the daughter of one Eobard Thawn, aka the Flash family's absolute worst enemy. So I guess you could say your mother. With this strange set of genetics, an invasion of an alien race called the Dominators, as well as being kept in perpetual motion for several years by the Universal Government, Bartholomew, or just Bart, also became a conduit for the Speed Force going by his own unique codename of Impulse after being transported to the modern day and eventually becoming the second Kid Flash under Wally West, who by that point had taken over for Barry as the Flash after he heroically sacrificed himself during DC's first ever reboot, Crisis on Infinite Earths, for over 20 real-world years. The thing I want to stress about the role of Kid Flash is that the role of Flash is an inevitability for them to inherit. It's one of the only sidekick titles other than Robin or in Marvel's case Captain America that almost guarantees the passing of the torch. And that's usually because it's all in the family. While Barry inevitably becomes a parent to his own pair of twins, Wally has his own wife and kids, kids with superpowers that use the Speed Force in unique ways beyond just running fast. The Flash family grew from merely two unrelated people with super speed to a multinational and generational group of speedsters always attempting to do something good in the world. The Flash, in a way, represents the best aspects of the DCU, a world with a unique history that honors traditional heroic values but isn't afraid to change with the times, granting the next generation a chance at redefining what it is to be a particular role, be a hero. At least, that's what I want to believe. In truth, DC has made some interesting choices in regards to the role of the Flash and the universe as a whole. First of all, they kill Wally West off the same way they killed Barry, artificially aging Bart up to become the new and incredibly reluctant Flash before he himself is killed off, inevitably brought back to life, and of course, both Wally and Barry return to the modern day, alive and well, and also both the Flash. For a time, things were fine. And then Barry went to- What the fuck? Flashpoint, the event comic written by Jeff Johns and illustrated by Andy Kubert, single-handedly altered the direction of the DCU from 2011 until this very day. Due to Barry's desire to see his mother alive again, he, along with a character that really shouldn't have been brought into the main DCU but fuck it we like money, rebooted the entire DC universe and forced many characters, including The Flash, to start from scratch. Except, not everyone! While some characters like Cyborg and Shazam were given new origins and places on the inaugural Justice League roster, others like Batman and Green Lantern maintained their prior histories, just truncated to a vague 10-year timeline. That means Bruce not only became Batman 10 years prior to the starting point of the New 52, but also went through four Robins and at least one Batgirl in the time it took Clark to become Superman. Confusing? Yes. Did it matter to Editor-in-Chief Bob Harris? Not really. The New 52 was a Hail Mary attempt at boosting sales for DC Comics, revitalizing interest in their products and succeeding temporarily, but the fact that there were 52 different comics being released over the course of a 2-3 to three year span, some not even lasting more than a single volume before being cancelled, proved that financially, the reboot was a bust. But regardless of sales, the company and the fanbase were stuck with an entirely new, slightly haphazard universe. One that combines several different canons and companies like Vertigo and Wildstorm requiring new origins for various characters across the board. This includes Kid Flash, who debuts around the same time as the Flash's own comic. This leads us to Scott Lobdell's Teen Titans, which ran from 2011 to 2013, primarily drawn by a man who can't draw feet named Brett Booth, as well as several others. 
Logdell was originally a Marvel and Wildstorm writer who was brought into DC by Bob Harris, wondering if he could give a unique spin on the Teen Titans and by extension a jumping on point for young and casual readers. Logdell's mentality when creating his roster was to keep things familiar, but in his own words, slightly tweak some characters. And by that, he means making them almost unrecognizable. For example, let's talk about Superboy, Connell. While the original Connell was a clone made from Cadmus using Kryptonian and human DNA in the wake of Superman's supposed death to potentially replace him, the new Superboy is a clone made by the organization called Nowhere, meant to hunt down young metahumans and secretly made from the genetic material of the Superboy from an alternate dark future. Jonathan Lane Kent. And while this clone is still called Connell, he's given that title not out of respect for a great Kryptonian Connor walked in the shoes of, but because in the New 52, the word Connell means abomination. Supergirl is the one who calls him this, by the way. This drastic change of motivation and origin is not just a Superboy problem, it's a problem with the entirety of the Teen Titans. Cassandra Sandsmark's mom is still an archaeologist, but Cassie herself is not a fan of Wonder Woman. Instead, she's a world-renowned cat burglar who falls into a predatory sexual relationship with a man named Diesel, both finding ancient invisible monster hunting armor that grants them awesome power with the potential of going completely berserk. Tim Drake, the now founder and leader of this Teen Titans incarnation, is no longer just an independent sidekick who found out Batman's secret identity. Instead, he's a modern-day Robin Hood hacker who stole from Penguin's offshore bank accounts, forcibly placing his family and him into witness protection to avoid future Gothamite crime. I'm not even going to touch Beast Boy and Raven because their origins and character designs from the time are so drastically different from the originals, and while on paper some of these designs and even some basic character quirks do confirm that the characters present are indeed who they say they are, they aren't the old versions of Superboy or Wonder Girl or Red Robin. Instead, they're entirely new characters meant for an entirely new audience of comic book readers, ones that did read this book if my own personal and close friends' anecdotes are anything to go by, but also plenty of hardened DC and Titans fans read this book as well. They didn't like it so much. I don't blame them. Every level of this story makes less sense the more you think about it. Most of the characterization, even with its original characters like Bunker or Skidder, falls flat and relies heavily on archetypes that the 2003 cartoon and even new Teen Titans from the 1980s eventually grew beyond. Events like a death game between hundreds of super teens or fights with Trigon and his dimension-conquering children feel bland and predictable. Fan-favorite characters like Young Justice's Artemis are introduced only to die within the same issue, and the characters we do have, like Skidder, just fuck off for over a dozen issues until the comic's cancelled. How would they find her? I don't know, Scott. At least have them try. The comic's worst, but most minute aspect is that Scott Lobdell sticks to Stanley's adage of every comic is someone's first comic. So, he makes the first page of every issue just a recap through stilted dialogue. Dialogue that consistently reads like an adult trying to write about teenagers because Lobdell himself was 50 at the time of writing it. I may rag on this comic, but that's not to say it's complete garbage. Scott Lobdell can, on occasion, deliver a good story. In fact, one revamp of a classic character Lobdell got to use in this run ended up being its standout character. Kid Flash. I'm talking about Kid Flash. An ongoing mystery throughout the title that is resolved in its final arc is who is Kid Flash? something that the main man in question doesn't even have a clear answer for. Left at a home for wayward boys without a memory six months prior to the start of Lobdell's run, Bart Allen, as he calls himself, discovers his inherent ability to run really, really fast. Knowing he's probably alone in this power outside of the Scarlet Speedster in Central City, he dons the title of Kid Flash and makes a makeshift costume in the hopes of not just getting Barry's attention, but also hoping to become a hero in his own right. And then he blows up a building. He's kidnapped by the organization known as Nowhere, and kept under lock and keep until Bart manages to find a way out, freeing a girl codenamed Solstice before magically finding their way to Tim Drake's doorstep. They really get there because Danny the Street is a titan in this. I, 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 he's the only one who dies. Sorry. Joining Tim's team after stealing one of his Red Robin costumes, Bart gets his molecules rocked by an adversarial Superboy, resulting in Bart's body becoming... unstable. Unable to remain in the current time period without some kind of anchor. After getting a custom suit made by Star Lab's intern Static Shock, Bart receives routine visions of his past, a world burning and people hurt, and it's all his fault. The longer he fights alongside his team, the closer he becomes to Solstice, a girl who warned the Titans that the culling will commence, a death game that will decide those who are worthy to stand as agents of nowhere. And their goals... 
of something that I still don't really understand, but fuck it, who cares? Forced into a game after being kidnapped yet again, Bart's assaulted by a super teen from a far-flung future, telling Bart he doesn't deserve to live after everything he's done. While Bart would survive this encounter and ultimately the game, his lost memories would haunt him more and more. Kieran herself would try to confide in Bart routinely, the experiments done to her at Nowhere and her prior involvements in the culling tormenting her to no end. And while these two became inseparable, Bart couldn't do the same. He was afraid of who he really was deep down, loving the person he's become as part of the Titans, and afraid of telling them out of fear of what they'd do. But when Solstice is seduced by a Trigun-possessed Tim, things change. After her secret is spilled to the entire group, Bart runs away from his friends and right into the arms of yet another potential captor. What makes things worse is that, after finally running into Barry Allen, Bart's made the suspect for a murder he didn't even commit, something he proves is false, but can't seem to shake the fear about. This feeds Bart's feeling of isolation, but Solstice tries to reach through Bart's despair, telling him she'll stand by his side no matter what atrocity he's committed. So when they're flung throughout the time stream by an evil Justice League, ending up interacting with a prior, angrier version of Bart, Bart and Kieran are forced to reconcile with the truth of who Bart actually is. Space Bin Laden. Bartor's family was part of the underclass in the 31st century, victims of the ruling spacefaring people's control. Forced to live on the streets and provide for his sister Shira, he inevitably found a job as a galactic delivery man for a shady company. One whose ship and subsequent crash granted him the super speed he would later use to inspire the masses, amassing an army of freedom fighters who will do all that is necessary to oppose the functionary. Yet that stalwart, radical mindset is grinded to a halt when Bartor harms a particular functionary soldier on the battlefield, his own sister, Shira. Bartor turned himself in and was entered into witness protection until the time for his trial arrived. While this was happening, however, Bartor's remaining followers would set up bombs on the functionary space station, hoping that when the day finally arrived, they'd take the fight straight to them. And they do, and it's fucking great. This is a Kid Flash who is the leader of a future terrorist organization, standing up to an oppressive, nonsensical government which holds an iron grip over the entire galaxy. And while he's defeated by a Superboy, who's actually the real John Ken at this point, but just ignore that, and given a life sentence on a prison colony, Bartor remains grateful for the friends he made on the Titans, happy that for a brief moment in his life, he was truly considered a hero. Solstice can't handle life without Bart, so she shoots one of the judges point blank, and they're like, yeah, that'll do it. These two lovers, these two broken people, are bound to the same fate, crash landing and surviving together in the same prison. They vow to unite and liberate the colony, hoping to give its people and the universe the lasting peace it truly deserves. And then he came back. What? Lobdell's tenure on Teen Titans ended in July of 2014 with the third Teen Titans Annual, which capped off the storylines of that particular run while setting up a newer, slightly smaller team still led by Tim. The series would be relaunched that September under writer Phil Pfeiffer and artist Kenneth Rockefert, aiming to tell a story that focused on the price of team fame and social media virality. Both creators previously working on the series Lobdell helped launch in 2011, Red Hood and the Outlaws. I'll admit, the first several issues of this run are really solid. While it still has Lobdell's canon to adhere to, the vibe is much more low-key and the banter is sometimes really enjoyable, especially between Bunker and Beast Boy, who is somehow green again. While some of Pfeiffer's jokes can be corny and Rockefeller doesn't stay on the entire run, the first five issues of this book look genuinely good and set up an antagonist that, while not typically attributed to the Teen Titans, does work well within this new continuity. Manchester Black who, instead of being a powerful psychic in control of his own ruthless super team, is a 19-year-old super genius on the board of directors of Star Labs, hoping to make the Titans into his own privatized super team, one who will obey his every order, no matter how dire. This all sounds like a decent setup, and the urban backdrop of Manhattan instead of the ever-shifting locales of the prior series works to ground this run of Teen Titans in its own distinct, fun way. And then Bart comes back. So Manchester Black has been building his own version of the Elite deep underground, and after some shenanigans involving Superboy coming back after genociding a small colony of alien refugees, manages to convince Cassie and her new teammate Power Girl into joining his cause. One of these members is of course Bartor, who is now pissed at Tim for some reason, saying he left him and Solstice behind the future to rot when he literally turned himself in! Tim even calls him out on this, but Bartor doesn't care, and we don't get an explanation as to how or why he came back to the present in the first place, with or without Solstice. 
So at first, he fights Tim's new team before Tim's decides to break into Riker's Island in the hopes of finding Despero. You know, the Justice League villain? In an effort to thwart Manchester Black's ever-evolving Keikaku. Keikaku means plan. Then Harvest shows up, the previous antagonist of the entire series, who's supposed to be dead by this point, takes Superboy back to whatever nightmarish future he came from, and the gang temporarily reconciles as they beat the shit out of Black and the rogue alien Psychic. After a brief detour to Gotham for a crossover episode, the aliens that Superboy previously killed an entire colony of shows up, takes away the team's newest member Chimera, who is just... there. And Bart, inspired by the whole separation of people from their home, runs the fuck away, saying he needs to find his own way back to the future and that Solstice needs him. The end. The last time Bartor has ever appeared in a comic is in the Flash Speed Buggy Hanna-Barbera comic written by Lobdell, where he only shows up at the end as a cameo. No closer to his goal of returning to Solstice, no closer at freeing his future, nothing. And Solstice? The girl who was left behind, the uber-powerful titan that the team loved at one point? She dies. Oh no, not in the future, because Tom King killed her off in Heroes in Crisis! One of the worst fucking events DC has ever done! I digress. That's the story of Bartor, who by the time he left was already being replaced. Back in the Flash books, they were setting up their own Wally West. Fans were repellent to the change of skin tone for the character, so when DC's 2016 relaunch DC Rebirth, they brought back the original Wally West while still keeping the other one as the teen kid Flash, making Bartor effectively useless as a character beyond the occasional cameo... or not. Like I previously discussed, this character may not be Kid Flash in the traditional sense of the word, but he's still worthy of being part of the Flash family. He fought on the side of good while still carving his own unique path. A radical with super speed stuck in the present without the woman he loves. Without the friends he's made, who have since forgotten his existence due to universe-altering events. A man who will do whatever it takes to see justice delivered, even if bodies start hitting the floor. Bartor is a tragic and flawed character. Someone who, like many missed opportunities of the New 52, deserves some kind of re-examination. While the Dick Grayson-led Teen Titans returned in 2015's Titans Hunt, Bartor in this era of the Teen Titans has been left to the waste bin of history. Cassie, Tim, and Connor have been fully rebooted post-Bendis' Young Justice. Bunker is still running around the DCU, but only in Lobdell's work of the occasional cameo in a DC Pride Month. Solstice was only brought back to life in service to Wally West's character during Jeremy Adams' Flash run. And Skitter doesn't exist, for lack of a better term. Same with Bartor in the eyes of DC's editors. When Bartor ran away at the end of Will Pfeiffer's run on the Teen Titans, it was a sign that things were going to change. Not for the better, or not for the worse, just change like all things do. While I'm happy that Wallace West still exists and wasn't turned into yet another Bartor, given DC's keen on pushing him as THE Kid Flash for the time being, most characters aren't so lucky. Because I can't call Bart or Bartor Kid Flash anymore. Because they aren't. And they never really were. Thank you for watching.